Well, good morning, St. Albans. I want to welcome you here today for a brief service of prayer and reflection on this, the sixth Sunday in the season of Easter. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you riches beyond our imagination. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things, may obtain your promises which exceed everything we could desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you keep my commandments. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these things, these commands, so that you may love one another. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. A few years ago, in the midst of my doctoral studies, I needed to make a decision. In some sense, you may say that I came to a fork in the road. I needed to make a definite commitment to a course of study. I could go one route and declare my intent to be a PhD student, a doctor of philosophy, or I could remain where I was and continue in the demin stream a doctor of the church. Now, you might think, oh, that's inconsequential, uh, maybe even a little bit frivolous, uh, but it wasn't a very easy decision for me to make. And my thesis director really helped me pray my way through this dilemma. Uh, she'd say one isn't any better than the other. The issue is one of discernment. Is God calling you, Dan, to primary ministry in an academic setting as a doctor of philosophy? Or is God calling you to a primary ministry in the church, um, a ministry in the church, with the church, and for the church? And that really helped me make a decision. That really helped me discern God's will. Because there's an old adage about vocation. And the adage goes like this, your vocation, your calling in life is found in that place where your great joy and the world's deepest need intersect. You know, I really like that definition because it's simple, it's uncomplicated, um, and it's very biblical. In, in my case, back when I had to make a decision about my major, uh, I realized that well, the joy, right, the joy that I experience in teaching and in preaching, it would find a more fruitful soil in the church, not necessarily in the academy. So I decided in order to fulfill my vocation, my calling, um, with the church, in the church, and for the church, I had to take a certain fork in the road. And today, Jesus says quite clearly in the gospel, uh, I appointed you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. That's verse 16 from St. John's gospel. 
Now, let's look back on last week's sermon just to recap a little bit. Um, When I talked about the wound of love, if you haven't viewed the sermon yet from last week, uh, go take a look at it because today's gospel reading is a continuation of the reading that began last week. And so today's sermon is continuing to unpack and expand upon last week's sermon. Um, And what I was saying last week, which we can revisit today, is the sense that in order for a branch, in order for a skion to be grafted onto a vine, both the branch and the vine need to be wounded. And the biblical story tells us that great things happen. Great things can happen when we are willing to enjoin our wounds to the greater wounds of Jesus Christ. There is, in fact, well, freedom in transformation when we do so. Now, it's not just about joining our wounds to Christ's wounds. It, it's, you know, Jesus doesn't want us to just be bumps on the log, right? As skions that have been uh, grafted onto the vine, there is an expectation that we become fruitful disciples. And so in today's gospel story, we hear him say, look, hey, hey, I appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Okay, so we look around our world. Let's just take a look around our world today. Uh, Simple question, where are the wounds? Well, let's begin there. One of the things that I have consistently heard since beginning at St. Albans is how much members of the congregation value the place, the parish, as a community of hospitality. You know, that's wonderful. That's great. It's a great building block. So let's take a moment and reflect on that word and that concept of hospitality in relation to wounds. Do you notice anything about the word hospitality? It's where we get the English word hospital. When the church is at its best, the church is like a hospital, a a spiritual hospital cultivating and healing wounded souls. Ah, do you remember that great old spiritual hymn? There is a balm in Gilead that heals the sin-sick soul. What might that look like? What might it look like if your joy, your profound joy, in being a community of hospitality and the world's deepest need, the world's deepest longing for community and intimacy were to intersect. What might a church, a hospital for wounded souls, look like at 4341 Ontario Street in Beamsville? Well, I read an article the other day that said something to the effect of If you were an evil demon trying to destroy human life on Earth, you'd probably invent something exactly like COVID-19 to slowly eat away and tear away the moral fabric of humanity. If we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be fruitful, not just bumps on the log, but fruitful, we don't have to look very far these days to find wounded souls. I imagine that the future after COVID-19 will be a future in which the most important work I will do as a priest will be human care. I anticipate that I'm going to be spending a lot of time caring for souls, and caring for souls will be a priority as we emerge from COVID-19. But should we expect anything differently? Jesus says in today's gospel, I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. When I was a kid, you know, I think back to when I was young, we, we all seemed to know who the wounded souls were. Uh, they were people uh, like the alcoholic down the road who only seemed to come out at night. Um, The wounded souls were people like the homeless men living underneath the St. Paul Street Bridge, 
the invisible people who were living in the Norris wing at the St. Catharines General Hospital. It's almost as though it, it, they were at an arm's length from us. We, we talked about them as though they were somebody else's concern, somebody else's problem. But what is happening these days is that there's been a revelation. It, it confirms a basic tenet of our Christian faith. And St. Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12, reminds us of the communal nature of our lives. He says there are many parts, but there is only one body. So if one member suffers, all members suffer. If one member rejoices, all members rejoice. Right? It's not just the work of the professional class to fix the world's problems for us. We are also active agents. And through our baptism, especially Christ's invitation to be active agents of change in our world can't be understated. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, maybe you think, Dan, it's it's insurmountable. What are you talking about? I mean, these are global problems. That's true, but here's a start, okay? Just here's where we might be able to start. Open the doors. <laughs> I mean, how simple is that? Start there and then consider, what is the thing that brings you joy as an individual, but also as a congregation? What brings you joy? What is the world's deepest need? What, what are those wounds? Open your doors and, and bring your joy to others. You know, my grandmother, she's 95 years old. She spends her days knitting cotton dish rags. You know, you might say big deal, right? Well, but let me tell you, at the end of the year, she donates bags and bags and bags of handmade dish rags to the church bazaar. And everyone says the same thing. When they see those handmade cotton dish rags, oh, those are the best dish rags. You know, it's simple, isn't it? It's very, very simple. Where does your joy and the world's deepest need intersect? And that's where you and St. Albans will find its health, its healing, and its meaning. That is what Jesus says. In fact, Jesus confirms it in today's gospel reading. Listen again to what he says. He says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made complete. Hmm. So, if I was going to cast a vision for St. Albans, and if I was to cast a vision for St. Albans' future, after COVID-19, I'd begin right here. Just one simple request. Open the doors. Open the doors. You know the story of your patron, St. Alban. He did the same thing. He opened his doors and the world remembers St. Alban for his courage and love. Do you remember the story? He opened the door of his home. He risked everything for the sake of offering hospitality to a soul in need. Alban may have thought that he was opening his door to save the life of a stranger. And by welcoming in the stranger, Alban would save the stranger's life. That is true. The greater moral of the story is, in the end, the life that Alban saved was his own. Open your doors to Christ. Be, be like St. Alban, because the life you save might be your own. Literally, symbolically, open the doors. Offer hospitality the thing that you find such joy and consolation in. Offer it to the world and for the life of the world. Hospitality. Become a hospital. A hospital for souls. A place for the healing and the cultivation of those wounded souls. Remember, there is a balm in Gilead that heals the sin-sick soul. 
And remember, always remember and trust that it is the simple things we do when they are done with love that make the difference. Jesus comes to us in that place where we least expect to find him. And now I'd like to conclude with a prayer. It's a Celtic prayer, and it's called the Rune of Hospitality. And I leave this with you today as an invitation to reflect on this theme of opening the doors to Christ. A Celtic Rune of Hospitality. I saw a stranger today, and I put food for him in the eating place. And I put drink in the drinking place and music in the listening place. In the holy name of the Trinity, he blessed myself and my family. And the lark said in her song, Often, often, often goes Christ in the stranger's guise. Oh, oft and oft and oft goes Christ in the stranger's guise.